Let's uh, pray and jump into the class. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for how you work in our lives and um, call us to things that we're not good at so that you get the glory and we can boast only in you and not in ourselves. Um, thank you. I pray for Greg as he preaches the same sermon again in a bit, uh, that you would encourage people, you would challenge us to just serve you with all that we have. In your name, amen. Okay, next week's the last class. You got your notes, uh, slide, just to review. These are the five main places we've been. Ah, man, my mouth is dry this morning. Um, death in the eternal state, intermediate state, place, the state of being, three ways in which the term heaven is used, the nature of heaven. We finished that last week. And uh, today we're going to jump into our condition in heaven. Uh, sixth major point of the outline of the class. What will we be like in heaven? Uh, will our bodies and mind, what will our bodies and minds and, and beings be like? Will we be able to think? Will we be able to see, to remember, to eat, to become invisible, to go through walls? Can we fly? Uh, I remember sitting in a seminary class, and I don't know if you know the name Dr. John Whitcomb, uh, back in the more 70s and 80s was his era. Um, in theology, he said, I think in heaven we're going to be able to fly. And I was captivated by that. It's like, oh, wow, that's going to be so cool. Um, will, will, will we be in a different condition in heaven than we are now? Uh, we will be in a different condition than we are now. Namely, we'll have fully realized the glorification part of our salvation. We'll have our glorified bodies. Uh, we will be as we were created to be and fully, um, fully glorified, fully fulfilled in, in the salvation that God's given us. Um, so I think there's two aspects that I want to talk about of our being glorified. There's the spiritual glorification and there's physical glorification. First of all, spiritual glorification. Uh, we will be finally and fully cleared of all wrong. We have been declared righteous now. Because of the cross, we are declared righteous. We're justified. But remember, that means we've been declared righteous, not actually righteous. Anybody here actually righteous thoroughly through and through? Uh-uh, no, of course not. But still, God sees us through the blood of Jesus so that we're declared righteous. There and then, we will be righteous. We'll be sinless. Um, no one will be able to bring any charge against us. Romans 5 and 8. We'll be morally and spiritually perfected. The process of growing more like Christ through sanctification, through the things we do on earth, will be done. We'll be finished. We will be there. We'll be completed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.8 says that we will be guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Guiltless, blameless, sinless, without any guilt or temptation or moral blemish whatsoever. And I have several references here, but I'm, I'm just going to keep moving. Uh, raise, raise questions as we come along, please. Uh, we will have full knowledge. 1 Corinthians 13 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. The incomplete knowledge that we now have will be replaced with a full understanding. Uh, no longer will we know God through reading our Bible, through prayer time, through scripture, through Bible studies, through going to church, um, trying desperately to sense his presence. I mean, how often have you been there where it's like, oh, I just don't feel like... I, my prayers are getting through, and I just don't feel close to God. Anybody relate? All of us. That's gone. That will be gone. That sense will be gone. Um, it's as if we have been, I, I read this, this illustration. It's as if we've been trying to court our spouse-to-be via letters, occasional phone calls. Probably today it would be texts and all that stuff, but I wrote this a while ago. Um, but we had never met face to face, just letters and phone calls. And we are falling in love, we're deeply in love, 
we do everything we can to get to know that person through letters, through phone calls, through texts, whatever. This goes on for a couple years. And then finally, we meet face to face and immediately get married. What an incredible expansion of knowledge of each other would take place, right? We've only known each other through letters and phone calls. We get married and we are face to face, intimate together. Wow, would we get to know a lot more about that person. That's how it's going to be with Jesus. Um, that's the fullness of knowledge that we will experience. Now, let me ask a question for, for some input, some discussion. To what extent will this fullness of knowledge go? Will we be omniscient? No. You don't think so? Only God is. Okay. Um, agree? Disagree? We are the church. We don't go to church. We are the church, and we will be with our, we're the bride of Christ, and we will be with our groom. We will be married to Jesus. So, no, we won't go to church. Oh, that's coming. Hang on to that. I have some interesting thoughts about that. Well, the Bible has some interesting thoughts that I think are interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree with Ruth. I don't think we're going to be omniscient. I don't think we're going to know everything. Um, we will know everything we need to know. I remember talking to my parents about heaven, and m mom and her wisdom would say something like, if, if God knows that you need to have your dog in heaven with you, how did she say it? Then you will. Or what, however it was. Um, if, if, if that's what God knows you need, then it'll be there. And I thought that was wise because I don't think that's what I need, but, but as a child. So if God knows we need to, we will know everything we need to know to be happy and satisfied in heaven. Yes? Thoughts on that? I mean, it says that we will know fully, but what's that mean? I think it means we will know fully everything we need to know. Okay, let's keep going. We'll be spiritually glorified. We'll also be physically glorified. Uh, this takes place at the resurrection of the believers when Christ returns in the rapture. Again, if my eschatology is right, any second Christ could return, call, snatch us out, and at that point, the dead in Christ will be reunited with their bodies at the resurrection, I think. Okay? Let me read 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. So not all of us are going to die because at the rapture, some of us get snatched out and won't die. Okay? Tracking? But we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. All of us will be changed. For this perishable body, this one, must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass in the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. All right, let's walk through this, get a little wordy there. Not all believers will die because of the rapture. But we will all be changed at this point and receive our glorified bodies, our 3.0 bodies. Remember from Burke's book, he said that right now we have a 1.0 body. If we die and go to the intermediate state, we have a 2.0 body. And then at the, at the resurrection, we get our 3.0 body. Okay, if that's accurate. Um, those who have already died will be instantly joined to their new glorified bodies. And let's say this happens right now. Uh, I will be snatched into heaven and on the way, somewhere in there, get my glorified body. At least that's how I see it. Questions, thoughts, disagree? Confused? Um, three passages in particular speak to the glorified body. I don't think, this isn't on the screen, but you might have it in your notes. I don't know. Do you? 
Okay. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Okay. But our citizenship, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So the text in another translation says that our bodies will be similar in form or to be like his glorious body. Our bodies will be like or similar to the body of Christ, the glorified body of Christ. What could Christ do in his glorified body? He could walk through walls. Eat. Appear and disappear. Could we say he could fly? I don't know if that's the right word. I think he just poof there and then poof over there and then poof over there. He did ascend into heaven. Yes, just like pew, gone instantly. I think it's interesting. Of all that cool stuff, I think it's interesting that he ate. He ate food. Now, does a glorified body have a digestive system? Um, you know, not to be crude, but just to think this through, do you have to go to the bathroom in your glorified body? Um, what's that? Poof, it's gone. Poof, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> or your body can 100% assimilate the nutrition from the food you eat? Maybe. I mean, you know, in heaven, we'll be eating from the fruit of the trees and so on. But Jesus ate fish on this earth. There could have been mercury in that fish. I don't know. Um, no mercury back then? Okay. <laughs> Pure fish. So these are just, we can't answer them definitively, but they're just interesting to think about. Um, and because the text says that our bodies will be similar in form, it would appear that we could be, do the same things. We can, you know, we talked about the New Jerusalem being this gigantic cube and, you know, are there elevators for the 396,000 stories? We won't need elevators. We'll just, we'll just go, be where we want to be. Second Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. Yes. We'll be what? Well, this is the text that says that our bodies will be similar in form to the glorified body of Christ. That's it. That's, that's, that's what we have. Similar is not the same. So maybe there are, well, presumably, let's put it that way, there are differences between our glorified bodies and his glorified body because he is God and we are not. So what those limitations will be, no idea. All we can do is... Sounds a lot of fun. <laughs> Three hundred ninety-six thousand steps stairs. Tammy. I think I think there's pretty clearly eating and drinking in heaven. I think that's pretty clear. Um, Maria. Exactly. Yeah, we're similar in image similar in form. We are not God. Don't hear me say that. Don't ever hear me say that. We will not become gods, little g or big g or anything other kind of g. Um, we, we are human, but we'll be glorified and perfected in, in that eternal form. Mm -hmm. Right. Infinite wine. The, uh, what do you call those? What's the cooler? The, what's the basement where you put your stuff in the basement? Wine cellar. Wine cellar. The wine cellar will never run dry. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Wine is an interesting metaphor, and I don't think it's a metaphor. I think it's literal in scripture. In fact, I just saw a book that's going to be published this month where uh, a, a theologian, a lady theologian who lit, grew up on a winery in, in Germany, wrote a book on the theology of wine in the Bible. I don't want to get it. I want to read it. Sounds fascinating. Um, anyway, 
Uh, other thoughts? Okay, 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if the tent, this is a, we looked at this text before, and it's a little bit confusing. If we know that, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, and I'm just going to do some commentary along the way. I believe that's talking about this body right here. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I think that's talking about our glorified body. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly body, our glorified body. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. That seems to be referencing the idea of not being in a disembodied state. So the idea of naked is I'm just a soul floating around. Um, for why, while we are still in this tent, this body, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed. In other words, don't take my soul out of this body and then I'll be naked, so to speak. But that we would be further clothed with our glorified body so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. Um, I think that's what the text is saying. Did some research and they're saying this is one of the most accusing verses in the New Testament, you know, and all this kind of stuff. It's like, wow, well, okay, so there's not a lot of agreement necessarily, but that seems to be what Paul is speaking of here. Um, this glorified body is straight from heaven. It's a shell designed for life in heaven. That's what we have. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 50. I don't think I put that text on your paper. Did I? That's a long text. I don't even have the whole text in my notes. You can look it up later if you want. But just a few observations where Paul is comparing um, our current body and our glorified body. He, he notes four major differences. Uh, mainly in verses 42 and 44, if you have your Bibles, and look at that. First of all, our present body is perishable. In other words, it can die. It's subject to disease and illness and death. We know that. Uh, brought way too close to home this week with Kathy Kapam's diagnosis with cancer. That, that's, that's this body. Um, our glorified body is imperishable. There's no cancer. There's no illness. There's no runny noses, there's no colds, there's no flu. Um, we are immune to disease and decay and corruption. I got my shingles shot this week. So I, Dawn went through shingles a couple years ago and I said, oh man, I, I don't want to do that. And so, you know, you get your flu shot, you get your vaccines, you take vitamins, all this stuff we do. Um, won't be an issue ever again. That sounds good especially those of us that are a little older and the bodies are falling apart a little bit more. Wow. Uh, secondly, our present body is sown in dishonor. It's corrupt. It smells. These bodies require a lot of work to keep them presentable in public. What did you do this morning? Don't answer this question. <laughs> what did you do this morning to make yourself ready so your body could come to church and not be offensive? Um, our bodies do things we wish they wouldn't do. We go through a lot of work to make our bodies presentable. Uh, our glorified bodies will be glorious. Uh, no deodorant, no showers, no haircuts, no shaving. They'll be perfectly glorified. They'll be, um, it'll be, a sh it'll shine and be the appropriate vessel to honor God and be in his presence for all eternity. Uh, thirdly, our present body is weak. Our glorified body is powerful. Fourthly, our present body is physical. Our glorified bodies will be spiritual. But I think there's some physicality to those two. Um, our glorified bodies will function beyond our comprehension. Was it Einstein that said we only use like 8% of our brain and he used like 10 or 12% of his brain? Does that sound right to anybody that knows this stuff? Something like that. Think about that. If Einstein used, let's say, 15% of his brain, what's the other 85%? I think part of our glorified bodies will be God saying, you got full use. And I think that goes into different dimensions that we can't even comprehend. I mean, Einstein was in a different dimension than most of us. 
And, and this is going to go even further. Um, we'll have full use of all of our faculties. We will fully enjoy life and all the pleasures that God has provided in heaven. We won't experience fatigue. We won't need naps or aspirin or coffee in the morning. No drugs, no artificial stimulants. Everything we experience will be fully satisfying. Um, it's almost unimaginable. Uh, how many times, and all of us have been there, where you have a really, really great day, you did some really fun stuff, and at the end of the day, you just feel empty. Like, oh, man. And I, I think it was C.S. Lewis. We, quote, we had this quote when you were kids. Life at its best is not enough. There's an emptiness. When you, when you do the coolest, most fun things you can imagine, it's not enough. But in heaven, it will be. We will be fully satisfied all the time, even on bad days. What's a bad day in heaven like? I have no idea. I don't know if there are any. Yeah, I don't think so many bad days. Um, let me read this quote from, from Burke, Burke's book. Uh, I don't know if it's on your notes, but it's on the screen. Just imagine that point of life you feared most, the death of, you, of your earthly body, suddenly frees you in a way you never anticipated. You feel alive. In fact, so much yourself and so alive that you have to adjust. It takes a little time to realize you're no longer in your earthly body. You still have a body, arms, legs, fingers, and toes. But you begin to realize that something's different as well. It's the same but different. An upgrade. Imagine. No more aches and pains. Those ailments and impairments are gone. And the limitations of movement in your earthbound body do not seem to apply to this new upgraded spiritual body. You still have your senses intact. In fact, all your senses seem turbocharged and multiplied. You sense and experience in a way that feels more real, more alive than ever before. All anxiety fades into an astounding sense of peace. Oh, I like that line right there. So many people who fear death are afraid of the pain of death. Yet many who describe it don't recall the pain at all. Instead, they speak of what Paul called the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Now, that's Burke's imagination. Uh, imagining what it's like uh, and having analyzed a lot of near-death experiences where people died and then came back and to see they said oh it was wonderful it wasn't it wasn't horrible at all um, it just sounds amazing um, I have this quote Spanish philosopher Miguel de Unamuno once tried out his theory of the idea of, the, of a belief in God, but there's no heaven. So he tried this theory out on a rather simple-minded peasant. The peasant thought for a minute, and then he said, so what is this God for? If there's no heaven, what's the point? That, that, that took me a while to process too, and you're all processing that, thinking, okay, what? Heaven and all that it entails is our hope and our reward. Jesus in heaven is the presence where we spend all eternity. If, if at the end of this life we die and are finished, then what difference does it make how we live? I believe they do. I'm not, I, anybody speak to ortho, Orthodox Judaism? Certainly the, the Jews of the Bible believed in a heaven. Um, at the last time at the resurrection I think resurrection is in the Old Testament David's you know when David's infant son died he said I'm gonna I'm gonna go to him so so people argue for all babies go to heaven from that text which I think's not a good way to use that text but David did have some theology that said I'm going to see him in the future somewhere good other thoughts on that
yeah, I, th- I, th- I think Abraham's bosom, uh, Lazarus referred the parable or story of Abraham and Lazarus, um, or Lazarus and the rich man. Um, it seems that Abraham's bosom describes a place of blessedness where believers that die, Old Testament believers maybe, go to Abraham's bosom. And it's the intermediate state. It's where, it's where believers hang out until they get their resurrected bodies. And unbelievers would go to uh, Hades or a, a place of punishment, but a holding place until the lake of fire is brought into being. Tammy. Okay. Yes. So I would say, Andy, there was definitely an awareness in that world and culture that there is a good, good place coming. If they used... Now, heaven, the word heaven is used a lot in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word. Uh, Shemayim, and it's translated heaven, it's often used a lot in the Old Testament. God is in heaven... Um, Barb. Yeah, what's the point? And I think even though this quote's a little bit, you have to think about it for a while, I think the idea is that resurrection, future presence in the presence of Jesus uh, in a place that we're talking about called heaven is our hope. Um, And without it, what we're most to be pitied. Yeah. Good, good. Thank you, Elise. Yeah, and Hebrews 4 talks about entering the rest, referring back to Psalm 95 about entering the rest. And I don't know if it's old hymns or the Bible where it says we cross Jordan into the promised land. Maybe that's an old hymn, I'm not sure. But that idea. Good. Okay, let's go on to our next point. Um, Activities in heaven. What are we going to do? We're in a garden. We're going to fish. Non-stop. Um, this question is probably raised more than any other and has uh, lots of good-natured answers like we're going to fish nonstop and we're going to garden and we're going to sit on a cloud and play harps and, and whatever. Um, we're going to praise the Lord. We're going to worship. Um, the idea of singing for all eternity does not interest me. Uh, it might some, but uh, it's like, oh, gosh, seriously? Um, <laughs> I know, I know. And if, it, if that's what we do, then it's going to be great. Um, God has not seen fit to tell us a lot about our eternal agenda, but we do know a few things. So let's take a look at those few things. First of all, we're going to rest. Is that an activity? Absolutely. Uh, Hebrews 4, we just, I just mentioned a great text on the rest awaiting God's people. There is rest in this life, you know, Sabbath and Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine. 29, take my yoke upon you, um, and so on. But this heaven rest is a more, it's, it's a final, more fulfilling rest. Uh, Hebrews 4, 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. To fall short of his rest in this passage means that you're found to be unsaved. You're found not to be in Christ, not a true believer. So you don't enter the rest of heaven, you enter the torment of hell. Uh, Heaven is the completion of the Christian pilgrimage. It's the end of a life of toil and warfare against the flesh, uh, against the world, against temptation, against the devil. Uh, This life is hard. Anybody disagree with that? Um, Sometimes it's very hard. 
Yes, there's joy for those of us that have the spirit in our hearts and even unbelievers. Sometimes I think they're having fun and joy too. It's, I don't, anyway. Um, but life is hard and we shouldn't expect it to be any different. That's, that's the way life is. Um, heaven is the completion of all that hardness and all that toil and we rest. Uh, verses 9 through 11 in Hebrews 4. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. I think most of you know I have a, a pretty good interest in Sabbath. And years ago I studied this passage in depth to try to determine that it was talking about an earthly Sabbath. And I concluded that it wasn't. Uh, that's elsewhere, but this is talking about an eternal Sabbath, a rest forever. Um, it's an eternal sabbatical. Greg just got off of a three-month sabbatical. And from all I hear, it was great. Imagine doing that forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> I think that's what grace feels like sometimes, though. Like we're cheating. <clears throat> um, somebody asked about Sabbath. You asked about Sabbath. Okay, Isaiah 66, 22 hints at there being a regular Sabbath day in heaven. This is a head scratcher. This is what the text says. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me. What's that sound like? A new heavens and a new earth that I shall make. Heaven, eternal heaven, says the Lord. So shall your offspring and your name remain. And from new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. So we take a Sabbath from resting. Well, I think there's... <laughs> I think there's work in heaven, and we're going to get to that. I think there's productivity. And so, um, point C here, we're on what? A... Uh, we won't get to it today, but point C in my notes talks about working and being productive and doing things in the same way that Adam tended the garden prior to the fall. We will have things to do. And so maybe one day a week we stop doing those things. What's the problem? There's no week. There's no sun. There's no days. Or is there? And no night. So how do we know when the Sabbath day comes? I don't know. This is this. This is yeah. There'll be calendars. There'll be calendars on all 386,000 of those floors of the New Jerusalem. And um, pardon? Sabbath is Saturday though. So. <laughs> um. So, you know, I don't know. We take a text like this and we, why is there a new heaven and a new earth and then there's from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath when we know there's no night and so on? How can there be a moon? How can there be a moon? Uh, it could be figurative language. Uh, new moon, uh, from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath is a common Old Testament expression referring to festivals and so on and seasons. Um, Yeah, it does. Does time pass in heaven? <laughs> so every 6,000 years, we get 1,000 years off. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting concept. It's fun to think about. It's fun to speculate on. And that's really all we can do is, is imagine it. And... These texts are so interesting, but they don't conclusively demonstrate uh, what will be. Um, other questions? The next activity, we're not going to get very far in this, is worship. Uh, we often think of this aspect of heaven, of worshiping God, and certainly we, we will. We're going to worship around the throne uh, of God and the Lamb and so on. Uh, we can assume that we'll do the same there. Uh, this passage from Revelation, I won't take the time to read it right now, is just a fabulous picture of worship 
in heaven around the throne of God. And um, I believe that's one of our activities. And I don't think it's going to be tiresome or boring. I think it's going to be absolutely, unbelievably crazy to, to physically see Jesus on the throne. Maybe the way Ezekiel did and the way Isaiah did. And, and you know, they saw Jesus on the throne uh, 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 in their f human bodies. We're going to see him in our glorified bodies. When they realized what they were seeing, they fell on their face and said, woe is me. Um, but this is something we're going to do. I don't know how it works. I don't know if it's, you know, every Tuesday we come and have a worship time or if we do it on Sundays, if there's Sundays in heaven. I have no idea. But I, I think it's just going to be part and parcel of our character and our nature to worship God in all of our perfection all of our glorified bodies will be able to worship him perfectly, completely. Because face, when we worship him now, it's not always, sometimes our motives are wrong. Sometimes we're a little twisted um, in this flesh, but there it'll be perfect. Um, all right, we're out of time, but... Um, Let's pick up next time and talk about service and work in heaven. What we will do uh, and, and we'll pretty sure I can finish the notes. Well, I have to. Um, I really want to get to the final question. It's already on your notes. The most important question about heaven is will there be animals in heaven? And I, I want to address that biblically and thoroughly so that we're clear. Lion and the lamb, Jesus rides it on a horse. Will, will, will my beloved pet be there? I think dogs will, cats won't. Um, <laughs> let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have given us. Uh, you've given us, given us enough tastes and glimpses of heaven that, that it's exciting and you haven't told us so much because I don't think we could comprehend. I don't think we would, we would grasp what you're trying to say. I think you did the best you could through John's eyes, through Isaiah's eyes, through Paul's eyes. And they used the language that they had at their disposal. And it's enough for us to go, I can't wait. And so, uh, Lord, help us to just imagine and think and pray and live this life in light of what's coming. In Jesus' name, amen.